Ready? Oh, okay. Hey, welcome everybody to Auto Geek Show Car Garage. My name is Mike Phillips, and tonight I have Don Wild with me. Don owns this really nice 1970 Mustang Mach 1 with a 428, right, Don? Yes. Okay, 428 big block. Now, this is a single stage paint, and we've already done a little bit of testing. What we found out is the paint is A, really, really soft, and B, really, really thin. So tonight, we're actually gonna go over tips and techniques for working on single stage paint by hand. Uh, we're gonna avoid the machines just because I don't feel the paint is able to take a machine polishing without causing too much damage to it because the paint is so soft. But the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and inspect it for above surface contaminants. Now this is garage kept, isn't it, all the time? Yes. Okay, so first take your clean hand and just fill the roof here. How does that feel? Feels pretty smooth, doesn't it? Okay, now try the baggy test. Tell me what you think now. Big difference. Big difference, huh? Yeah, it feels Same like paper. you feel little bumps everywhere, don't yeah. you? Okay, so what that is is above surface bonded contaminants. So what we're going to do is we're going to start out by claying this. Now, later on tonight, we're going to rub this down with a product that came out about the time of the Model T. So um, in the past, we've used a lot of different products out here in Auto Geek Show Car Garage. Tonight, this is going to be a Meguiar's night. Last week, we rubbed a car out with uh, Blackfire and Mothers. Tonight we just have one car. We're going to use some products from the Guires line, and that's why they're one of the reasons why there's some chemical synergistic compatibility there. So we're going to start out with the Meguiar's clay, then hit it with the Meguiar's ultimate polish. Then we're going to carefully rub it down with the Meguiar's number seven. This is a very oily product. And this is going to push the oils into this uh, paint here and really bring out the color. Then we're going to seal it with the wax. So that's going to be the process we're going to use. Hey, Renny, come on in. Just to let you know, Renny, we're live right now. And uh, so anyway, so first thing we're doing is going to clay this car. So go ahead and let's get started. Here you go, Lou. You got one? Okay. There you go. You can, we'll share this. There you go. Well, we're going to clay this first, and we just tested it using the baggy test, and it's pretty bad. And you see the stripe here? Try not to run the clay or any polish onto this stripe. Well, good to see you. Hey, and everybody, tonight we got a special guest. This is my son, Rand. Rand, come here. Wave your hand. Say hi to everybody out there in the internet world. And Rand's helped me rub out a lot of cars in his life. So this is just another one on his, uh, I, his list of cars he's buffed out. Tell you what, I'll share this with you. Can I borrow the uh, spray? Okay. Here you go, Ray. And we're going to get the horizontal panels too because we felt those and they're kind of rough. Hey, Jeff, how you doing? Yeah, we haven't started the roof yet. Go ahead. I sent you a question. I saw that question. Your question was, uh, does... Uh, does uh, number seven work on clear coat paints? Okay, that's actually a common question on the forum. Let me go ahead and see that when you're done. Hey Jeff, tonight this is gonna be something kind of different. The paint on here is really soft, it's single stage, and it's also really thin, so we're gonna rub this out by hand. Oh really? Yeah, it's kind of good because a lot of people still don't have a machine, and working by hand is kind of a lost start nowadays because a lot of people don't really know the technique for using a polish. By hand. So I'm going to go over a couple tips and techniques for that. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to clay this. Anyway, my friend Rennie had a good question that he posted to the forum, actually to the thread that the video's in, or the sign-up thread actually. And his question was, um, this number seven product is really popular. It's been around, like I say, since the early 1900s. And um, his question was, is this product any good for clear coats? Now it's really good for single stages. And some guys do use it on clear coats, but one of the things about a clear coat is the paint is much denser than single stage paint. This is fairly porous, and it's, uh, it's actually a lot softer. Clear coats tend to be harder and a lot denser, so things like polishing oils don't really penetrate into the clear. They kind of just sit on the top of the clear. So while you can get a, cl a clear finish using number seven on a clear coat, it's mostly just topical. And a lot of times, just doing a good job of polishing and then going to your wax, you're going to get the same results. So a lot of guys would skip that step. Now, as clear coats get older, 
they tend to open up. And um, the word for that is called interstices. And uh, if you, it's kind of a hard word to find in the dictionary unless you know how it's pronounced, but it's, it's, there's a I-N-T, E-R-S-T-I-C-E-S, interstices. And interstices mean microscopic cracks and fissures. So as a modern car with the clear coat finish gets older, is exposed to the outdoors, things like washing tend to put micro scratches in it. As the paint heats up, it expands, and then when it cools down, it contracts. When it does this over time, you get what's called interstices in the paint, so it tends to open up. And then if you were to put number seven on, then some of those oils can get down to the paint and give you that clarity that, that you're looking from from an oil and a polish. But if you got something that's brand new, like your brand new 2011 Camaro, probably not gonna see too much res uh, difference by putting that on or not putting it on. So the number seven though would act as a filler on top of the clear coat of Paul. Dan, Dan, Dan with uh, Muscle Express. You were here last time we did the two Camaros. Yeah, yeah how you doing, Dan? What do you think of this? Good to see you. This is a 1970 Mustang Mach 1 with a 428 in it. Wow. And it's single stage paint, and the paint is really thin. So we're going to rub this out by hand mm -hmm. and be very careful when we do it. But we already tested it to see if it needs to be clay, and there's a lot of contaminants on it. And the thing, about, um, the thing about contaminants on paint is anytime you have contaminants on paint, it creates surface texture. And I think what most people would agree is a really good looking finish is a really glossy finish. And gloss comes from smoothness. So anytime, if you feel the paint and you feel contaminants on there, that means the gloss has been diminished because the contaminants are there. So instantly, just by claying, look at this brown stuff that's coming off. As you pull those contaminants off, you make the paint smoother, and that maximizes the gloss. Plus, it enables uh, next, the next step when you go to polish it, the contaminants are out of the way. So the polish can get right in and get to work. And a lot of people, what they do is um, they wash the car and then they wax it. If they don't clay, first they get those contaminants off, the wax actually never gets to the paint because it's right. got that layer of contaminants in the way. So claying the car actually helps the paint to last longer. Okay. Did you do the windshield? I have not done that yet. I think I need some uh, spray detailer. Hey, thanks, Steve. You want to get this one? And then tonight I'm going to go over just a few tips and techniques for working by hand. Now, one time, or sometimes, Working by hand gets real important, like if you got a real thin panel, like the A pillar, the B pillar, uh, cars with louvers, uh, thin areas up here between the fresh air grill and this chrome strip between the windshield. Can't really get a machine in here, so it's, it's kind of important to be able to uh, still have some good uh, techniques and some skills to work by hand for all those places you can't get your machine. Anyway, so that's kind of what we're going to do. We're going to finish claying this, then we're going to hand polish it twice, one with a mildly abrasive polish, and then one with a, one with a non-abrasive polish, then we're going to put a coat of wax on it. And then for all this black trim here, we're going to use a product called Wolfgang Trim Sealant, which is, uh, it looks good now, but what it does is it's going to take this and make it just a little darker without adding gloss. So it'll kind of bring out a rich, dark sheen. Okay. Good job, Brand. The front is that uh, has anybody got the lower portion here? Okay, then that needs to be done. Okay, what was the other question, Randy? That was a good question, by the way. That's a, that's a good question. So I'm going to go ahead and repeat that. Um, the question Rennie had was, uh, Rennie, by the way, was, um, uh, has a 2011 Camaro that's uh, red, jewel, red, red jewel tint. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very pretty color paint that's been retired, correct? They're never going to come out with that color again. So that makes your car kind of rare. And it's the original paint. And his question is, is can he use a product like number seven, which is a non-abrasive polish, 
to apply it to the paint and fill in some of those really fine scratches before he puts the wax on instead of polishing them out just to preserve the paint and keep his machine polishing of the paint on his car down to say maybe once a year. And yes, you can, you can do that. Uh, it's, that's originally what that product came out for. It was, uh, the original name for that product was Sealer Reseal Glaze. Queen for the day. Queen for the day. And it's, uh, it's water soluble, it won't last very long. The idea is to apply it, it'll fill in those microscopic swirls and scratches, and then put the wax <laughs> over the top of that. And, um, but the original name, Sealer Reseal Glaze, meant to seal or, with another application, reseal those fine scratches by filling them in. Now, people started confusing the word seal and reseal as a paint protectant, like a synthetic polymer sealant, because that's called a sealant, and the word sealer was used in that name. And it caused confusion, because if you ever applied that product and washed your car or ran it through a couple uh, days in the rain, you'd see that it, it didn't last. And so then people were upset that, you know, hey, this product isn't lasting. Well, they had the wrong idea. So they took that name off and called it Show Car Glaze. Show Car Glaze, give it a glaze like a donut, make it look all shiny for the weekend for that car show. That, that's why they, named, they changed the name. I think it was back in the 90s. But it used to be called Sealer Reseal Glaze because it was used to seal or reseal hairline scratches. So good question. So yeah, you could do that. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to put that on, then we're going to put a coat of wax over the top of it. Are we going to use an abrasive first? Or we gonna we're going to use the Ultimate Polish. We're going to use a couple of products from the Ultimate line. This is a new line that the Meguiar's company launched. And um, so we're going to use the Ultimate Polish, which is a fine polish. It doesn't have a lot of cut at all. But if you look at the paint, like get over here somewhere where you can look down, you can see that it's kind of yeah. hazy yeah. looking. Okay, so that's oxidation. And single stage paints will tend to oxidize where a clear coat, because they're so hard, they don't really oxidize. All that happens to them is you get swirls and scratches. Now, since that clear is sitting over the top of a color coat, it makes the swirls and scratches show up to your eyes real easily, but they don't really oxidize. Single stage paints tend to oxidize. And when I first met Don, that's what I noticed. I looked at the paint, I thought, well, while it looks pretty good, it's not only oxidized, but it has some swirls and scratches. So that's, so, and Don, normally what you do is you just wash and wax the car, right? Yes. And so, since it's exposed to the air, and oxidation takes place when cars are exposed to moisture and air, single stage will tend to oxidize. And if all you do is wash it and then wax it, you're just sealing that dead oxidized paint onto the car. At some point, you need to get in there, use a polish, get the dead paint off the car, then put the wax on. So that's what we're gonna do tonight. Okay, is the whole thing now completely clayed? Okay, so if, if we're done claying, let's gather up all the microfiber towels we've used and get these out of the equation and put those over in the, uh, the hamper for dirty towels. We'll get rid of the uh, clay products here then. Thank you. No, what we want to do is we just want to be very careful. I'm going to go for some techniques. And the reason why is I think that if we put the tape on there, we risk uh, damaging the paint. And um, right here, let's see, can your camera come in and get a shot of this at all, Yancy? This is, this is one of the clay patties that was used on the car. And um, you can see some of the oxidized paint has come off and also some dirt, some contaminants that were actually bonded to the paint. So now that we've clayed it, we've removed some of the gunk that was sitting on the top of the surface. Now we're going to go for the deeper cleaning by using a light polish. Okay, so for this we're going to use Ultimate Polish and foam pads. And I'd like to get everybody's attention and come over here. And we're going to use these gray microfiber towels for wiping this off. Just let me go over a couple of techniques for using a polish by hand. Now this would apply to any polish that you can use by hand or machine. If you look at the back label here, it says can be used by hand or DA or orbital. First thing you want to do is anytime you're using a liquid that's been sitting on a shelf is shake it a little bit. Okay. And then you always want to inspect your applicator pads. So just visually inspect them. Now I know these are clean, but they're a bright yellow. And if there were any kind of contaminant, I'd be able to see it. So I could go ahead and either get a different one or kick it off there. Now the next thing we want to do is we actually want to prime this. So we're not going to bring dry foam down on the paint. So I'm going to take and apply some of this right onto the pad. First, I'm going to pull out the safety seal. OK. Gotcha.
OK, so just kind of like when you're priming a pad, when you're going to work by machine, I've applied some polish in here. I'm going to take, I'm going to push it in, into the pad, and kind of moisten the pad. And I'm only going to do about half the pad, because generally, when you work by hand, you hold the pad between four fingers and your thumb, OK? And then you're just going to be pushing down on about half of that pad. Now, the next thing I want to do is then add a little bit of just a drop on there. Thank you, Lou. And we've got this matte black stripe here. Now, one of the things we don't want to do is get any of the polish onto this matte stripe because it'll be hard to get off. We want to damage the stripe. So you can place your finger here, use it as a guide. And then you want to take first and spread this out. And the easiest way to spread a polish out is with an overlapping circular motion. So we're going to spread this out. And then you can come down and work this in straight lines or in circular motions. It's kind of personal preference, but it's easier to actually get a product spread out by using an overlapping motion, because that way you can take the product that was on the finish there and move it out from where you first deposited. If you take something in a straight line and you're trying to spread it out over the surface, it's just a little more difficult. So I always spread it out using an overlapping circular motion. Then once I've got it spread out, then go ahead and work it. Now, any place we've got a raised body line here, I want to use what I call the rule of thumb. Okay? You want to stay about a thumbnail's distance away from it. We do not want to rub on these body lines. So another way to do that is just put your finger along here and just whoop, got the wrong side. And then just kind of come up to it. Because this paint is soft and it is thin. And if you rub on that body line, chances are you're going to go through the paint. So that's a technique for working on single stage paint to avoid going through on the, the high points. Then all you want to do is you want to work a small section at a time. Then take a clean microfiber towel. Can you hand me one of those, Dan, or the one here? And don't let this dry, because this isn't a wax. Go ahead and just wipe that off. And I think you'll see, yeah, it's a lot more clear. And so that's kind of the goal, is remove some of that light oxidation and then take out some of the swirls and scratches. And you want to do that quickly before that dries, so give that another wipe. There you go. And if we leave any residue, it's okay. When we come back with number seven, that's going to take that off. The number seven is very oily. So there's some clean pads up here. So grab one. We're going to go ahead and share the polish, and let's just start tackling this car. And again, stay away from the body lines. There you go, buddy. So, Don, do you show this car? No, I mean, I go to car shows, but not for any trophies or anything like that. Just for fun? Yeah. Yeah. He just likes to work on it. He just likes to work on it. Like four years now. Have you ever taken it out on the drag strip to see how fast it'll go? Nah. Yeah? But does it go pretty good? Yeah, it moves out pretty good. It's got a big block. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of, do you know what the gears are in the back of this thing? They're 350 now, but originally it was 390. Oh, so 390 was pretty low, yeah. and someone put a little more highway gears in it, I see. Yeah. <laughs> you did. Yeah, when I bought it, it had 430 gears, and it was too steep to have. Plus, it probably improved your gas mileage a little yeah. bit, huh? <laughs> I drive it. <laughs> Do you drive it every day? No. No, but I don't trail it or anything. Yeah. I mean, we take it to Turkey Ride Run. I went to the Turkey Rod Run for the first time this year, oh, and uh, yeah, I've been to a lot of really big car shows in Southern California, like the yeah. big good guy shows. Yeah. Uh, Turkey Rod Run's huge. Yeah. It's yeah. even slowed down now because of the economy, but when the economy was doing good, it was So just one thing I'm noticing on this dry single stage paint, as soon as you apply the polish and you're done, go ahead and wipe it off. And it'll wipe off a lot it easier. Like yeah, the, and another problem is single stage paint tends to absorb really well. So it's absorbing all the carrying agents out of the polish. One time I had a guy come up on the forum and uh, he, he was new to detailing and he did not understand that a polish didn't need to dry. So he applied a polish to his entire car, he let it dry, 
and he figured if letting it dry a little bit was good, letting it dry overnight would really help. So he let it dry overnight, and no, it gets better. He was getting ready to go to a car show, okay? So this, he got up early Saturday morning, and he went out to get the polish off, and he said it was like concrete, he couldn't get it off. So he was panicking, and he came up onto the forum, and he asked, hey, I need some help here. How do I get this polish off? And so I told him, I asked him, have you ever heard the saying, like removes like, or like dissolves like? And he said, no. And I says, well, take the product you use, go back out to the car, reapply it, liquefy what's already on there, and then before it dries, wipe the whole mess off. So I went out and did that, and he came back up on the forum and said it worked flawlessly. So he got it off, then he put a coat of wax on, and I said, ah. I said, for a wax, you always want to read the directions because some waxes are what we call a whoa whoa. That means you wipe it on and you immediately wipe it off. And some waxes, the instructions will say, let it dry to a haze. So I said, read the directions carefully because while the polish he used wasn't supposed to dry, the wax he was using was, was supposed to dry. And I didn't want him to get all gun shy because he had a bad experience because he made a mistake with the polish. So. This, this whole section here has been done. I'm starting to work on this and come your way. And really careful on the high, high points there. Well, something also that's kind of interesting about working on single stage paint is modern clear coats are basically a film of plastic, just clear plastic. Single stage paints like this, um, these are typically made from seed oils, like flax seed oil, cotton seed oil, China tongue nut oil. So it's a real oil product out of something grown in the ground typically with a pigment in it. And it's what I would categorize as a, as a real paint versus a clear coat is, is modern technology, is synthetic as a layer of plastic over the base coat, basically. And it's getting so rare to have the chance to work on single stage paint that I always tell guys on the forum, if you get that chance, you know, enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people don't even want to respray a vehicle in single stage, so it's just something you had to... Yeah, and I, I actually, um, oh, yeah, no, that's, it's, uh, well, some of the paints have been outlawed, you know, right. because they're what they call an a solvent evaporation paint, and um, the EPA uh, requires them to spray paints that don't put so much solvent into the air. Waterborne paints are being used for the base coat, but solvent clear coats are still being sprayed for the top coat. Yeah, I just actually checked with the guy on that. They're spraying all water-based paints. And uh, they, he did tell me that he finds that they match really well. Yeah, I heard it was easier. Yeah, a lot easier to get a good color match. I have a, a friend up in uh, North Carolina, and um, his, his dad passed away, and he left him an all-original 1976 Camaro Rally Sport. And um, it has the original single-stage enamel paint in a metallic. And he's gonna, he says he's going to trailer it down here, and we're going to do, uh, do an extreme makeover on it. And that's something we've got to be really careful with, too, because it's a metallic, and the metallic is in the paint. And the metallic back then is actually aluminum flake. And what happens with the aluminum flake is the, each side of the flake will actually oxidize, and you can't get inside the paint to polish each side of these tiny little flakes. So what happens is when you rub on the, the finish, even though the car is red, when you wipe it off, your pad will turn gray, just like it would if you were buffing out an aluminum wheel. And that's oxidation coming off the paint, and you can get a lot of it off the surface, but anything that's internal, you can't get off. Now, the good news is it's been kept in a garage all this time. So it's in really good shape. But it does have a lot of swirls and, of course, light oxidation just like this. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. 
Like I say, the, the turkey rod run, I went to it this year, the first time I went there, it's massively huge. It takes you three days just to see the whole thing. Did you get this part, Jeff? Okay, I'll let you tackle that. I'm gonna keep moving around the car. Has someone knocked out the roof? Okay. Yeah. That's done, okay. Uh, has anybody got up here? Okay, you wanna get up here and get this side ran? Okay, where are we on the vertical panels over here? All done? Okay. Vertical panels over there? Done. Okay. So, is anybody, uh, as you're working on your paint, or working with your pad, did you turn your pad over and see four pressure points? Four little darker areas? Yeah. yeah. So I had that on mine. And what that is, is when you hold a pad and work by hand, you can kind of, I don't know if you can see it very well, there's four pressure points on this pad where there's more pigment built up. That's because I held this with my thumb on one side, my four fingers on this side, and then what happens is you have pressure points there. Now, that's not so much of a negative thing, but when you work by machine, since you're not actually holding the pad, you have equal pressure over the entire face of the pad, and what that means is 100% of the pad is going to work for you when you machine polish a car. So a machine generally does a better job because there's no pressure points. That's the point. Okay, so next up we want to use the number seven. Has anybody here ever used number seven before? Raise your hand. You've used it? Long time ago. This is a very unique product. It's very oily. And a little tidbit about it. Um, I have some of the original bottles from the old days, which were glass. And the reason they were glass is because plastic wasn't invented until I think the late 40s or early 50s. So if you made a product, it all came out in glass bottles. So that's how long this product has been around. Plastic wasn't invented yet. <laughs> And early cars, the, the early cars like the Model T were painted with uh, shellac, lacquer, varnish, basically the same thing they used to protect wood from rotting. They brought into the automotive world were coating the, a lot of early cars had a lot of wood in them, you know, so they would coat the wood to keep it from rotting and the metal to keep it from rusting. But there were no major automotive paint companies back then because the car was a new thing. We were all still riding horses. Uh, but when this product came out, it came out in a clear bottle and the color of the product would change from year to year. And the reason why is because it's based off of plant oil. And so whatever this product was and whatever the growing season was for that year, say it was a dry year or an overly wet year, it would change the plant, which would change the color. And we as people, we tend to like everything to stay the same. It's like if you go get something and the next year it's a different color, you're like, huh, I don't know. So they started putting all the products in opaque bottles like this. So you couldn't see the changes in, or variations in the color. So that's where they transitioned from clear bottles to opaque bottles. Just a little tidbit, because I, I know a couple guys in the industry. <laughs> OK, so we're going to switch over to the number seven here. Now this product a little bit goes a long way. So I want everybody to get a fresh applicator pad. Now we're going to do the same thing, Take and start out by pre-wetting your pad here, priming it. That way the pad is lubricated. And also I want everybody to start out with fresh clean microfiber. So whatever microfiber pad you have, let's go up and put it in the dirty towel bin. Let's see, what's a good color? Let's switch over to the purple pads. Okay. Are these all the same but just different colors? Uh, some of them have different nap lengths. Different uh, nap lengths on, or different size have different lengths. But uh, they're, they're all just a little bit different. The color kind of denotes the differences. Now, the other thing I want to point out about this, good question by the way, is this is another product that you don't let dry. So you take and you apply it. And basically you're going to work this in like you are putting skin lotion on dry skin. You want to work it in really well. And I think you guys are going to notice as you're applying this that it's very oily, very slippery on the paint. And you want to go over each section two or three passes. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to push this oil into the paint is what you're trying to do. And what this does is it's, it brings out the full richness of color. That is the technical term to describe what this product does. And then carefully wipe it off before it dries. Man, doesn't that look good? Uh, I'll grab one. Oh, Let's go ahead and put those in the bin too.
There you go, Don. Here's some more. It's one thing good about working at AutoGeek. We have plenty of everything. <laughs> yes. Now, in the show car circuit, up until the days the clear coast came out, what they would do with this product is they'd put this on before a car show, and they had a term in the industry called queen for a day, because the effect wasn't long lasting. It lasts through the weekend, maybe another week, but the, the rich, wet look that it created would tend to dissipate over time. So it had the term queen for a day, but it would give the paint a real wet look, and a lot of times when guys would win a car show and people would say, what are you using? They would never share the secret. And they'd pour it into uh, mustard bottles or ketchup bottles, anything, so people couldn't see what the label was. But anyway, that's, that was called Queen for the Day. And another thing that was kind of unique about this product is a lot of guys, this is all they ever used. They never used wax on their car, so they would polish it often and never wax it. And the only way this actually works with a single stage paint is the keyword polish often. Because what wax does is it creates a barrier on the paint that locks the oil in, locks everything else out. And if you don't use wax, then the paint will tend to oxidize, but the oil will tend to escape the paint. Uh, but if it's a show car and you're polishing keyword often, you didn't need to wax the paint. And that's kind of why um, I just know this for a fact that McGuire didn't bring a wax out till 1951. 1951 was the year Frank McGuire Jr. Uh, passed away. And he was adamant about not putting wax on paint because technically, if you polished often, you didn't need to wax the paint. And it was his opinion that paint was better polished, not waxed. But after he passed away, the problem was is we as people, we get so busy, we don't have time to polish often. So wax extends the amount of time between having to polish it. And so uh, after he passed away, so the problem they ran into in the car world was since McGuire's didn't have a wax out, people would use the McGuire's number seven polish and then guess what they would put over the top of that? Think back 1950s. Blue coral, Blue coral. Simonize. Um, what was another one that's out back then? 50s. I don't know about Glyptone. I think there's something from the 90s. Yeah, 60s. Yeah, we're going back to the 50s though. Simonize. Simonize. There's another one that was real popular back then too. Johnson. Um, believe it or not, I think Texaco had a wax out back in the old days. A lot of the car, gas stations sold waxes to their customers. Then there was a lot of brands out that no longer exist now. Need some more polish there, son? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, it has a very unique smell to it. Yeah. Now, there's another product that's very similar to this. It's called number three. And uh, as I've worked in this industry, a lot of car shows, I've actually met a lot of old timers that use number three and number seven. And the reason they used it was because they found it wiped off easier by hand. And the primary difference between number three and number seven was number three was called machine glaze. And it was a wetter, wetter version of number seven. So as it's applied by machine, the machine generates heat. It would make it gummy and hard to wipe off the number seven. So they brought out the number three as a wetter version so it could be applied by machine without getting gummy once it got heated up. Has all this been done? Yep. Okay, how about back here in the back part? Uh, I don't know if the back trunk lid. Well, that's the difference between number three and number seven is the, the wetness of the product. They're both very oily, but the number three is designed to be machine applied, number seven hand applied. However, they can both be applied by machine. Uh, I don't think the number seven should be applied or can be applied by rotor. You could try it, it'd probably get all gummy, but it can be applied with an orbital, like an old fashioned uh, orbital polisher or a DA, modern DA polisher like a 
Porter Cable, uh, Meguiar's uh, Griot's Garage, or a Flex DA. And the problem with the uh, rotary is it just generates too much heat too quickly for a product like this. I don't know, what do you think, Don? See the color difference now? Yeah, it has a real wet look to it too. Look right here. So we've clayed it, hand polished it, hand polished it with a non-abrasive product, and now the, the clarity, the richness of color is really coming out, but so is the gloss. The gloss is completely amped up. Okay, the vertical side has here been hit? You, okay. Has this door been hit? All been hit? Okay, I think we're ready for a wax. Okay, same thing. Let's get these applicator pads, these towels out of the picture so we don't cross contaminate anything. Uh, just throw them over here. I wash these and reuse them. In here? Yeah. Okay. Actually, what I do is um, I put them in the, the pads I put in the wash machine, and then I reach my hand there and squeeze them. Because, yeah, you got to, well, whatever's in there, you got to flush it out. Okay, then just in kind of keeping with the, since we use the ultimate polish, now we're going to switch over and use the ultimate wax. This is a hydrophobic wax. What this does is hydrophobic means water fearing. Hmm, smells good. And it's going to make water beat up. Now, water beating up is a good thing and a bad thing. People like the way it looks. You know, you can say, hey, look at the water beat up. Doesn't that look cool? So it does look cool. The problem with water beating is, is you don't want the water to actually beat up and then dry on the paint because if there's any contaminants in the water, as that water evaporates, it shrinks down. The contaminants in the water, as it becomes less, uh, it uh, becomes stronger. It, uh, what's the term? It um, becomes more concentrated. So if there's any kind of like acid rain or something like that on the paint, as the water starts to evaporate out, the contaminants are in a smaller body of water, and they can actually etch the paint and leave a hole there. They call, we call that a crater etching or a type 2 water spot. So while water beading looks really cool, you don't want to let water beating take place and then have it actually dry on the paint. So like if a sprinkler goes off and you're not around to wipe the car down, you could actually, if there's something in the water, get an etching instead of a, uh, uh, just a spot on the water, actually etching in the paint. Okay, same kind of thing. Let's go ahead and take and... We're going to go to the green microfibers, the really soft with the rolled edges. And uh, just for fun, let's make sure that this is supposed to dry by hand. Thin coat and tar car, second pass recommended. Let the product dry to a haze, okay? So this, the first two products we use were both supposed to be applied and then instantly wiped off. This is a product that you want to put a thin coat on and then allow it to dry to a haze. And be very careful at this point that we don't get any of this on any of the black trim. Oh, there's some more in the bottom drawer right down here. Yep. Okay, I'm going to set some of these out here, but remember, you don't really need them right now because this product has to dry to a haze. So we're going to get a thin coat over the entire car, then we'll wipe it off after it's dried. And how long a coat of wax that has to dry has to, uh, takes to dry, a lot of times that depends on the temperature and the humidity. Um, in here we have the air conditioning on, which we can thank uh, the CEO of Auto Geek Max McKee. It's very comfortable in here, isn't it, guys? Yeah, it's very comfortable. And so for that reason, it might actually take a little longer to dry than if you were doing this in your garage, especially here in Florida where the humidity is high, but the temperature is also high.
Okay. Need that? Okay. Here you go. Here you go, Rainy. Has anybody got the roof right here? No. It doesn't look like it. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Um, next Thursday, we have another car scheduled. I'm trying to think what it was. Oh, I th next Thursday? Yeah, I think it's uh, okay. Now there was a guy that came down here at, when we did the Camaro. His name was uh, I think it was Dan, and he has a green 1969 Firebird convertible. It says the paint job. I think he says is about 12 years old, and I think he said the last time he waxed it was right after it was. 30 days after paint, so it hasn't been really taken care of in all these days. He says it still looks good, but what I kind of find is when someone tells me their paint looks good and I look at it, it's really not my, my idea of what good looks like. Yeah, a little different opinion there. Is it a base coat clear coat? Or? Yeah, I think it is a base coat clear coat, so it'll be a little, we'll be able to machine polish that one. And this is a guy I just met out in the parking lot because he drives a, for a daily driver, he drives, a, I think it was a 1970 Chevy pickup with a big block Chevy and it's got a custom paint job. And uh, I've seen him drive by our building out here for a couple years now. He just, he just, I think, got it finished and whenever he drives it by, I can tell because he usually, he's testing the horsepower with it. <laughs> you can tell he's going by. I don't know if he's trying to get my attention, I think he's just having fun. But I, pull, I seen him one day poking his head out of a shop around here, and I stopped in and said hi to him and um, invited him down for uh, Dan's Camaro buff out, and he came down. And, uh, and then he said, well, you know, his truck didn't really need no work, but he said he had another car in the garage that needed a little work. So I scheduled that for next Thursday. I got this side, real thin coat. See, and that's kind of the thing about it is if you put it down thin it's kind of hard to see yeah okay and remember son we're gonna let this dry before we wipe that off okay is everything coated back here this this quarter okay so this door still needs it Hey, Steve. Oh, sorry. Did you bring your Camaro up? No, I didn't. No, he didn't? Okay. Dan, what did you drive here? Don't ask. <laughs> what did you drive here? Okay. With pink ballerinas. With her on the tail. He's got a park behind the building. I went from school Camaro to a Kia. Put it out of the form. Yeah. Get the ballerinas there. Well, that's pretty funny. And you, you had your choice of a Camaro or a 69 or 70 Chevelle, and you took the Kia. Yeah. Hey, save gas. I was running late, so yes, that's what I did. <laughs> I thought about it. Look at the rain. It's not in the rain. Yeah. Now, have you taken the Camaro out and won any shows lately? Oh, yes, a few. Yes. Uh, I mean, lately. I know about the three. Has there been anything more recently? No, nothing more recently. Okay. Well, three's not bad. No, I'll take it. Yeah. Okay, so most of you guys, since I've met you, you all now machine polish, correct? Except for Don. Okay, 
So now, after spending most of your time machine polishing to come back and work by hand, what do you think? <laughs> okay, and uh, Jeff, you detail full time, right? You have, when's the last time you waxed the car by hand? Today? Okay, and you wax it by hand? D date it? Wow, see, that's not even by hand yet. In the old days, yeah. So now, just real quickly, the one way you can tell if the wax is dry and ready to wipe off is called the swipe test. So you take your clean finger, and I've got a layer of wax here, and you give it a brisk swipe. Then you've got to get it at an angle, and look where you swiped, and the paint should be clear and glossy. Come over here and check this out, Don. So I swiped it right there. Get it in. See that? Yeah. Okay, now, if you swipe it and it smears, Okay, that means it's not dry yet. Let some more time go by. But when you swipe it and you have clear glossy paint, that means it's dry. You're ready to wipe off. When you're using these microfiber towels, remember I always fold these inside out so the short nap is on the outside. Flip it over so the long nap is on the outside. Fold it four ways so you have plenty of cushion to spread your hand. Then you just want to gently wipe that wax off. Because at this point right now, we're creating a work of art. So you want to go back in and if you wipe too coarsely, you could put in some tallying marks. And they might not show up underneath the fluorescent lights here, but they could out there underneath the sun next time Don's at a car show here in Florida. Yeah. Yeah, you do everything by machine now. I had a, a friend um, in the forum world, he goes by the name of Scott Wax. His real name is Scott here, he's a good friend of mine. And uh, he was famous for doing phenomenal show car work, and he did all his work by hand. And uh, he came to one of my uh, clinics way back in like 2006, and we had a little competition. Uh, he and another guy, went down the sides of a car to see who could wax the car the fastest. One guy with a DA, one guy, well, Scott was working by hand. And I think he beat the guy with a DA, but that day he switched over to working by machine. <laughs> and now he does phenomenal work by machine. <laughs> yeah. I have posts on the forum, the only time I ever work by hand is when I have to, because it's so much faster and actually you get better results when you work by machine. Oh, yeah. And, and the paint is more clear. So before there was a lot of a, like a fog, a haze to it. And now it's totally clear. Good job, guys. This looks good. What do you think, Don? Looks good. Okay. So the next thing we want to do is we want to go ahead and take, we're going to take that Wolfgang trim sealant and rub this flat black wing down, the flat black louvers over the back window. And we can actually hit the stripe up here. So let me get a few new applicator pads out. Is there any more extras up there? Pretty cool. Yeah. You ever use this on flat black surfaces? Okay. So next thing we're going to do is all the flat black surfaces, I'm just going to take a foam applicator pad. This is the Wolfgang Exterior Trim Sealant. 
And the thing about anything that's matte or flat is you don't want to use anything that's going to dry and then dry white. And sometimes some waxes might take a couple weeks before they really completely dry and turn white. And then once it's embedded into this textured surface, it's going to be really hard to get it out without destroying it somehow. So you want to make sure anything you use is completely safe. Now this is safe for flat black surfaces, plastic, rubber, and vinyl. I'm just going to put a little bit on here. And can I get someone to grab a clean microfiber towel out of the cabinet? Oh, it doesn't matter. Just a nice plush one. Okay. And then after I take and rub this in, wipe off any excess. So this is going to just kind of be what I call the frosting on the cake. Because if you make the paint all shiny and clear, and you leave this kind of how it turns, uh, kind of it loses its uh, luster, you know, its dark sheen. Looks like a little bit goes a long way. Yeah, you could use it on interiors, rubber, vinyl, plastic, trim. And then again, just kind of work this in like a. Let me get this side right here. No, it's a. Yeah, just wipe it off. That's why I want to get the wax on first. Okay, go ahead and wipe that off real gently. Okay. It's, co it's concentrated is what it is. Okay, come up here. Yeah, look at look how it's, you know, like I said, now it looked good before, but now it has a real yeah. dark, rich sheen to it. No, this will cure to the surface, so that's the benefit to it, so it won't run off in the rain, or if you wash it. And I'm going to... Well, I don't know if it's, I'm, I'm sure it's more detergent proof than, you know, things like this that are similar. The problem with detergents is they're so strong. That's why you should always wash your car with like a non-detergent car wash soap in the first place so you don't strip off any protection. Okay, this side is done. I'm gonna get her to your side and get that side though. Yeah, it looks good. Look at it, it's nice and dark, but it's not turning white. And, and at the same time, it's not all glossy, you know, because you don't want to make a matte surface glossy. Okay, I'm gonna go back and you hit the louvers. Um, I think I think we got the last one. We went through about twenty or thirty of them. <laughs> this is actually kind of therapeutic, you know. Just sitting here rubbing out an old classic Mustang. There's a lot of people in the world, you know, the detail cars that, you know, they never get to work on anything like this. And uh, so I always cherish all these types of projects. I've worked on a lot of different cars in my life. I don't think I could say I've worked on one of everything, you know. A couple weeks ago, we had a 49 Packer down here. And I've worked on some older Packards, like from the 30s and the 40s, but never a 49. You were here, yeah. Wasn't that thing cool? Sitting on that Cadillac frame with the Cadillac engine in it. We had that AC Cobra down here for the same night. Yeah, um, yeah, we do. Uh, actually, I was gonna put some um, something else on there since it was kind of a Meguiar's theme night. If you um, go out there on my inventory shelves to see if there's a Meguiar's tire dressing, if nothing else, there's number 40 out there, which we can use. Yeah, and there's not, there's not a lot you can do for a matte finish, you know. You're not going to make it smooth and glossy, but 
but just to make sure it has a uniform dark sheen and that's what you want and that's about the most you can do and then the key is just finding a product that'll do that without messing everything up and this I think you were saying earlier this is the original set of louvers that came on this car so there's reproductions but it's worth more to have the real deal isn't it yeah do you ever meet any guys with classic Mustangs like this that would like to have these louvers on their car yeah a lot of people even from put them on back then Okay, now I'm going to be rubbing at the bottom of this, so make sure you give it a wipe too, okay? Just don't want to leave any excess on there. Wow, look at that. That looks good. Did you find that, Rennie? It's in a tan. Okay, there's a tan bottle. It has the number 40 on it. I just saw it out there. I know it's there. Yeah, Meguiar's number 40. So what do you normally use for a tire dressing, Don? Um, Anything? Yeah. I'm trying to think of the name. It's, it's real oily, so. Quaker safe. Quaker safe. OK, I've got this. I got the uh, here, and I, there's a little bit on the paint, so make sure we give that a, a good wipe. And a lot of times, just a little technique. Um, Jeff, I know you probably know this, but Anytime you have anything that's real oily on a slick surface, you actually want to um, wipe the majority off and then give it a real slow wipe, okay? And what that does is it allows enough time, like up here I see some film, that gives enough time for the product on the surface to transfer off the surface and onto the microfiber towel. So uh, I see, I watch guys do this and they get their hands moving at light speed and they, there's no time for the product on the surface to transfer to the towel because they're moving it so fast so slow down for that final wipe okay so you want to shake that really well and uh, let me show you a little tip with this this is a this is a water-based dressing it's been around for I'm gonna guess let's see I need a tire swipe here we go this is a polish applicator Okay, here we go. Okay, this is a water-based dressing, and it typically won't last as long as a solvent-based dressing. Okay, here's the benefit. If you want to get it off, you can get it off. Once you use a solvent-based dressing, it's harder to get it off. And t uh, tires have a, something that takes place is called blooming. Now, when they make rubber tires, the tire manufacturer puts an ingredient into the rubber called uh, anti or uh, it's anti anti ozonant anti, it's anti ozonant when that meets ozone in the air it turns brown so if you've ever seen a tire with brown on the tires that's this chemical in the tires that's coming out of the rubber meeting the ozone in the air and it turns brown we call that blooming it's supposed to happen it's a natural process and what that anti ozonant is doing is is that as your tires are spinning at a high speed it works its way out to refresh the rubber and keep it from cracking. So that's supposed to happen. The negative part is when it turns brown, it doesn't look good to us. So you clean your tire and then you put a dressing on it. Well, that means theoretically, you wanna be able to get whatever you put on there off, right? Cause you got that blooming going on no matter what, unless you don't drive the car. That's why if you see people that park an RV, that's gonna sit for like six months, what do they do to the tires? They cover them to keep the sun from hitting them. But th what happens is when you don't drive tires, that anti ozone it doesn't work its way out, so they dry rot on the outside. And that's part of the reason tires will dry rot besides just exposure to a moist, wet climate. But it's better for the tire to always be rotating so that anti ozone is coming out. But anyway, that's a little bit of, about that. So then just take this, and this is just a little tip if you're out there watching. If you just take this and spray it on the tire, you're going to get it all over the wheel. So instead, take and just bury your nozzle into your applicator pad. And this is, again, this is kind of one of those products. It's kind of like an armor all type product. It's been, been around since, um, oops, been around for like 30 years now. So, hey, 
How about the special guest? Yes, I did. Somebody can see. Yeah. Tell you what. Once you take and dress the tires here. Here you go. Go ahead and work that in really good. And then this will just add the finishing touch. So the paint looks good. The flat black looks good. We clayed the glass. It's all clear. Now we'll dress the tires or put a sh dress the shoes on this car. The sneakers. <laughs> Looking good. Work it in real good, especially around those white letters. He's a pretty good little detailer, isn't he? He's also a pretty good guitar player and a pretty good singer. What's your favorite song to play, Rand? Rocky like a hurricane? Scorpions. Yeah, Scorpions. He's got good taste. What's your next favorite song to play? Um, Smoke on the Water. Smoke on the Water? <laughs> yeah. Do you know any Boston? You can do more than a feeling? Yeah. They're coming out on tour again, I guess. Oh, really? Yeah, for the past 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move down to the next tire. When do you guys want to take, not one of those, but like a utility towel, like one of the green ones or blue ones in there, give that a final wipe so there's no excess on there? This has a light cleaner in it. So as long as you stay up on it, it'll pull that blooming off. Absolutely. Yeah, kind of, oh, hold on. Kind of refreshing it. And also clean any uh, grime off those white letters. Yeah. yeah. Then if you come back with a clean microfiber towel or even like a, just some sort of utility towel and getting that excess off and it'll leave a nice, uh, it doesn't add a lot of gloss. It gives it a natural yeah. sheen. Like the rubber would look as it came out of the Brand mold. New, right? Now, I, I actually worked at a tire recap store when I was in, uh, uh, high school on the weekends. Yeah, so I know what rubber looks like when it comes out of a mold. It just has a natural flat sheen to it. Oh, the bottle is loop. No, that was the Wolfgang trim sealant. Make sure your trim sealant we used on there. There you go, buddy. That's uh, called Meguiar's number 40 vinyl rubber cleaner and conditioner. It's a water-based product, not a solvent base. Looking good. What does this look like here, Mike? It doesn't look like wax. It's almost like it's some type of acid or something, maybe. That yeah, the paint. The paint there. is mottled right okay. there. Something's so landed. Like yeah, but you know what? See, if it was a liquid that landed, it would have run this oh, yeah. way. It ran. Oh, this way, yeah. yeah, one of this way or that way. So uh, hard to say what that would be. Gosh, that's kind of strange. Yeah. yeah, I see what you're saying. It would roll this way. Yeah, but it went downward. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Don. Look at this thing. It's clear. So, yeah. now, now, a lot of times, like on the forum, I always talk about what you want out of a finish is a clear finish. And that applies to clear coats, but it also applies to a single stage. Because when this first came in here, and I posted the pictures up on the forum, it had oxidation, which looked like a, a form of opaque whiteness on there. And so it wasn't clear. If it was clear, you'd see the color coming out, the full richness of the color. So what we've done when we polished it was we restored clarity of the finish, allowed the color to reveal itself. And of course, the, uh, the clay, you know, detailing clay removed all the contaminants. And this thing looked good. I mean, most people look at this car and thought it looked pretty good. I thought it looked really good. But I knew we could take it to a little higher level just by claying it, light polish, good fresh coat of wax. And now the wax is going to last longer because we, we prepared the paint to accept the wax. Uh, a long time ago, I had to write um, a set of what's called frequently asked questions for detailing. And one of the most common questions people ask is, how long will Brand X coat of wax last? And the technical answer to that is it depends first on how well the surface is prepared to accept the wax. That's the first criteria. It has nothing to do with what's the wax made out of. You know, that's, that's important too. But if you want the protection ingredients to bond to the paint, well, you need the paint prepared to accept them. And that means a clean surface. So. 
Okay, now what we really want is Yancey to come back to run the camera in here and get the beauty shots. He had to go pick up his daughter. That looks good, Rand. Sure. You know, there's, um, and that's a good question. Let me go ahead and repeat the question so anybody in the audience there can hear it. But the question was, is there any advantage to applying a second coat of wax? Now, there's usually two camps with their own point of view for that. And the first camp is two thin coats ensures, that's the key word, ensures a uniform coat over the entire surface, so a, a uniform appearance and the same amount of protection over this area, this area, this area, this area, everything. Now the other camp would be a lot of my friends that are pro detailers that do this for a living. So they're doing this five, six days a week and they're so good at this that they get a uniform coating down with one application and they don't believe they need to do a second application. Now the average person does this what? Once, twice, maybe three times a year. And what happens is they start out and they're kind of fresh, they're doing a pretty good job. As they start getting around the car, they get tired and now they're missing spots. Okay, so they're not a pro, they're a weekend warrior. So a lot of times they're not probably doing as good a job as some guy that does this every day for a living. So for that person, yeah, to go back and apply a second coat, you ensure uniform appearance, uniform protection over the entire surface. Good question. Um, I will tend to put uh, two coats on when I do a car um, just to make sure I have uniform protection over the entire thing. But I always do everything by machine, so it goes a lot faster. Um, very rarely do I do anything by hand. The last car I did by hand was a 1938 Packard. And the paint was so thin. There were spots like in the middle of an area that you, it was dark blue. You could actually start to see white, okay? And the reason for this is because someone besides me over a course of a long time, because this was a very old single stage lacquer paint job, had used coarse compounds on it. And they didn't have to, but that's, you know, that's how we always do it. So they rubbed it out with compounds and took all the paint off. Um, I have actually got an article, Don, this is, uh, if you ever run anybody in uh, talking to people, I have an article up on autogeekonline.net and it's called The Secrets Removing Oxidation Without Using Abrasives. And the way you do that is you, I, in this article I show how to use number seven, which is very oily. You guys had a chance, very oily, wasn't it? And then for your abrasive, you use terry cloth, okay? The terry cloth is the abrasive. The number seven is a lubricant to help the, the terry cloth to, to glide over the surface. And the terry cloth and the number seven together gives the number seven, it allows the terry cloth, the, the nap, which is the loop of the fiber, to bite into the finish and pull that dead oxidized paint off. And the reason I have this article for this is because if you were to have found this, say, find this in a, someone's garage, been sitting there for 20 or 30 years, the primary thing Don would want to do is preserve that original paint. And you can do that if you just use some of this, little elbow grease, the right product, and avoid real aggressive compounds because their abrasives are sharp and they, they cut too deeply. And if you take too much paint off and you've got to repaint it, you just ruin the patina, you know. So a lot of guys, they want to they actually preserve that original paint if they can, even if it's not going to look perfect, to them it has more value than repainting the car. Here's a good example of that. I have a friend that owns the last AC Bristol to roll off the AC Bristol line, I think it's in England. Now we all know the AC Cobra, but the AC Bristol is what the Cobra came from. And, um, and he found this in a barn. This is a true barn find. He says it's worth about $3 million. The biggest ding he gets on that car for points and value is he had it repainted. Okay. Now I didn't meet him until a couple years ago, but if this thing was in a barn for years and years, it's possible that paint could have been saved. Okay, but here's what I find in the world. Most of the time when someone finds something like this, a classic car that's been sitting under a tarp in someone's garage or in a barn or some shop, they pull it out and let their friend, the detailer, buff it. He throws a compound down with a wool pad and a rotary buffer and peels all that antique paint off. When you have single stage paint and it's old, it becomes brittle and dry. So anything that you use to abrade is gonna actually just completely grind that paint off much faster than it normally would. So what I show guys to do is when you find that barn find, that barn treasure, instead of jumping in there with aggressive compounds, go in there with the number seven, a terry cloth towel, 
rub that number seven in and then let it soak overnight and just let them oils seep in and bring that paint back to life and give it a little bit more flexibility then go in and if you're going to compound i wouldn't compound it anyway i'd just use a a fine cut or a medium cut polish i wouldn't get so aggressive as to use a compound but first go in and kind of revitalize the paint then work on it and um in my article i actually got a picture and what i did is i took the number seven and I put a drop on a paper plate and I took a picture of it and what you see is a drop of this green liquid on the plate. I come back 24 hours later and I take a picture of that number seven drop and you can see where the oil moved out in the plate, not on the plate. It went into the plate and it moved through it through what's called capillary action. The same thing will happen for an old single stage paint because it's porous. You couldn't do this with a clear coat, but you can do it with a single stage paint. Anyway, so that's the article. It's actually up on uh, Auto Trader Classic also. So Auto Trader took and put it on their website just because they have so many people that are into antique cars with original paint. So anyway, that's the car. What do you guys think? How'd it come out? It looks good, doesn't it? Yeah, it's all clear and glossy. And if you're out there watching, we're actually we're waiting. Yancey had to uh, run an errand. We're at, waiting for Yancey to come back. What he's going to do is bring that camera down here and go in and get some close-ups. So if you're sitting at home behind the computer, you can see how this looks close up. But uh, it does look good. When this car first came in, there was a, a white haze to it. And although it had a lot of shine to it, that haze was the oxidation on the very top surface. So we kind of peeled that away, and then we gorged it full of the number seven oils, then we coated it with a coat of wax. And now it just, it glistens. I mean, it looked good when it got here, but now it's a true show car finish. Then we rubbed out the black. Of course, that looks good too. It has a nice dark, rich sheen to it. And dress the tires, clean the glass. This thing's ready to cruise. <laughs> you know, a lot of times when people uh, bring their cars down here, then they leave, they go back out into the real world. Their friends say things like, hey, did you get the car painted? <laughs> They're like, nope, just took it to Auto Geek and had it polished. So this looks good. Yeah, it looks good. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do is I'm going to text Yancey and see how far away he is. I'll let him know we're done. He probably didn't realize we're going to get this done so quickly. Bring the Kia in. I kind of want to leave it here because then when Yancey could come down and everything uh, there's something to be said about when you're taking before and after pictures to keep the uh, everything in the same position, but that is funny. Hey, we did an extreme makeover down here on a Dodge Neon clear coat. Yeah, now a lot of people, it was the blue one, and the clear coat was so oxidized it turned white. Now, typically clear coats don't readily oxidize, but if you neglect them enough, heck, anything will oxidize. And this guy did that, he neglected it enough. <laughs> like he never did a thing to it. He sits outside where he works, sits outside where he lives, and um, it just completely oxidized. I, we, uh, that extreme makeover, we used uh, Dodo Juice, uh, Need for Speed, One Step Cleaner Wax, and we did it all by machine. So we clayed it first, then we used a one-step cleaner wax, and part of the reason was, was, actually there's two reasons we did that. One was because um, I wanted to show what could be done with the one-step cleaner wax, okay? Now, usually you get better results if you break the process up and do a dedicated cleaning step, a dedicated polishing step, and a dedicated finishing step like we did here. But I have an article up on the internet. What that article says is whenever, as a detailer, you want to match your services to your customer. So I could tell because this thing was already oxidized and neglected that this guy was not into detailing. So I didn't want to do a three-step for someone that A, wouldn't appreciate it, and B, wasn't going to take care of it anyway. And uh, okay, so Yancey says K, he's on his way. Um, so I, I, what, I, what I did is I mashed our services to him, and that's doing a one-step. But the other reason was is to show guys that are new to detailing. Uh, what happens to new detailers is they get up on the forum and they see guys doing this kind of work, uh, typically by machine. So, but they're doing washing, then claying, then a compounding, then a polishing, and then a finishing step. So there are five steps into just the paint. If you're starting a detailing business, you got to get that paint down to two steps, you know, besides washing. Wash it, clay it, one step cleaner wax. 
and get it out the door or you're not going to make any money. Am I right on that, Jeff? Yeah, sometimes you don't even clay it. So you do. But a lot of guys... It, it, depends, it depends on the tool. That's a good question, and let me answer that. So what Rennie asks is, if you're going to compound the paint, you actually need to clay it. And the answer is yes, and, and, and especially if you're going to be using any kind of tool with foam pads. And the reason for that is because a, a foam pad is soft and gentle. That's one of the things we like about it when you're buffing out paint. But if you've got contaminants, which are like little bumps, that's what they feel like, what it'll do is just glide over them. It'll tend to make them shiny bumps, but it won't take them off. Now, a wool pad with an aggressive compound on a rotary buffer, pff, obliterate them, take them right off with a lot of paint. You don't need to clay that. I'd still clay because of two reasons. One, um, if you take all the above surface contaminants off using detailing clay, A, you've got them out of the way. So when you go to work with your compound, you don't got nothing mixing up with the compound that could be adding swirls into the paint at the same time. Because it's hard to say what the contaminants could be. Right. What if it's some sort of overspray paint, OK? I don't want to grind. I don't want to loosen paint off and then take that overspray and grind it back in as I'm trying to make the paint look beautiful. See, polishing paint is all about working forward in the process. Every step should make the paint look better and better and better to the last step, putting the wax on, wiping it off, and have a flawless finish. What a lot of guys do is they work backward in the process. The products, the tools, the pads they're using, while it might be doing something that's correcting, it's also dulling the paint down. They're working backwards. And it's just because maybe they're using the wrong pad or chemical or possibly technique. So the idea is, is to learn what tools, what pads, what products work that are in our industry that work. Because there's still some archaic stuff out there that just doesn't work very good. But if a guy's never seen it, how does he know any better? But you always want to work forward in the process. You know, every step should be doing something that makes that paint look beautiful. That's a very good question, too. And uh, I'll repeat that since I'm mic'd up. But so Rennie's question is, is when you're using detailing clay, how can you tell the clay is spent or it's so loaded full of contaminants that it's now become dangerous to use? So typically what you do with clay is you'll clay a section of the paint, flip it over and look at it. If it looks pretty clean, clay another section. If it's starting to look contaminated, fold it into itself. I usually take and twist it like taffy then re-knead it to expose fresh clay. But at some point, you're going to have so much contaminants loaded up into the clay that it's time to throw it away. And about the only way you can really tell is visually, experience, common sense. Now, I've got some clay that we used on another car that's completely contaminated. And I wouldn't use it on my car because it could cause some damage. I'd use it on your car, though, because I don't really care about you. I only care about me. No, that's just a joke. But yeah, you just want to look at it. And if it becomes so contaminated, it's time to pitch it, get new clay. Is there a rule of thumb every four cars? Here are the average guy that stays on top of the paint. And uh, let's say I'm, I'm going to clay my car four times a year. I'm going to do one correction per year. And everything in between, I'm just going to clay. And then I'm going to put a, a, a sealant on it or a wax. That's another good question. And the answer to that is actually is, depends on how contaminated the, the car is. Here's a good example. I use this analogy all the time. My dad has a 1965 Ford Thunderbird convertible cream puff. It's white on white on white. White interior, white top, white paint, immaculate. It sits in the garage like a trophy car. Mom's car sits outside. Okay, So dad, you know, he, he takes it to a lot of car shows. He probably clays it two or three times a year and then puts a fresh coat of wax on it. His clay is going to last a long time. The car is sitting outside, though, because what's ever in the air is going to land on it. That clay is not going to last as long. Again, you're just back to using common sense. But good question. Got another one ready? Yeah, it's full of good questions. Actually, I, I've written a couple articles on clay, including a, a frequently asked questions, which is in my how-to book. And you've just about nailed every question. So then there's a couple more. Um, there's different grades of clay. So typically, you know, there's there's ultra fine, fine, medium, and aggressive. And the aggressive is so aggressive that if you use it, you could actually cause what we call clay haze. 
clay haze is a really nice term for clay scratches. <laughs> and, uh, but typically, the people that use aggressive clays are going to be professional detailers that know what they're doing or body shops that are removing overspray. And both these groups, these different businesses, both these people, after they're done claying, they're going to be machine polishing. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to remove whatever's on that car quickly, because time is money when you do this for a living, and get to that machine polishing step. For an enthusiast, though, they should usually stick with a, uh, a ultra fine to a fine, possibly a medium. If, if you've really got some contaminants on there, then you could jump up to a medium grade. And the biggest difference between that is, is real simply, if you've got an ultra fine clay and you're trying to remove contaminants, it might take you 10 strokes to get all those contaminants off. If you're using an aggressive clay, you might do it in four. Boom, you're moving to new territory. So it's just because the way clay works is there's actually an abrasive in the clay. A lot of people don't know that. Um, when I first started using clay, gosh, I hate to date myself, but this will be back to the early 1990s when it first came out. I asked this guy, because it was a brand new product, and I got to learn just like everybody else, says, how does clay work? And he says, well, he says, well, feel it. Feel it. Feel how it feels kind of tacky? And I go, yeah, it's kind of sticky. And he goes, well, as you're rubbing over the paint, it pulls contaminants off. And I thought, well, that makes sense. It's tacky, so it's pulling contaminants off. Later on in life, I met a real chemist in the car care industry. Just for fun, I asked him, how does clay work? He says, well, Mike, you see there's an abrasive in there, and it works like a piece of sandpaper. So you've got the contaminants on the car. You rub the clay over there. It sands the contaminants. As the particles are sanded off because the clay is tacky, it pulls it onto the clay. And once you get down to a smooth surface, it starts to glide, and you know it's time to move on to new territory. So it doesn't sand the paint. It only sands the contaminants off the paint. And, uh, but it's a totally different explanation as to how clay works than the guy that wasn't a chemist that told me how it worked. And uh, so then, of course, ever since I learned that from a real chemist, I've been sharing that with everybody that attends one of our classes here. Well, Yancey's back. And Yancey, what we've done is we've went through, we clayed this, we hand polished it, then we, we rubbed it down with number seven Shokar glaze, then we applied a coat of the Ultimate Wax by Meguiar's and carefully wiped it off. Then we treated all the flat black surfaces, including the shaker hood scoop and the, the matte stripes here and the louvers on the back window with Wolfgang exterior trim sealant. And that restored, I think your camera is going to catch a very dark sheen, but it's not going to turn it white and opaque. But if you want to go ahead and take over and get the beauty shots, I'll let you. Everybody's quiet. Well, this was kind of a unique uh, project we had tonight just because we did the whole thing by hand, you know. And uh, what's, what's, what I, the first thing I noticed is you guys that have been here before, after we get going, this place is noisy, isn't it? You get about 10 polishers going through your, yeah, it's just a buzz. It's like a horn's nest in here. And uh, tonight it was very quiet. We could have put the stereo on, in fact. We should have. The truck project is coming along really good. Is this car from New York? Originally, yeah. I saw a National Speedway sticker way back when. Four lane. Hey, Don, would you mind if we asked you what did you pay for this? Um, Fifty. Fifty thousand? Where did you find it at? Um, up in Vero. Vero Beach? Yeah. Actually, Palm Bay is north of uh, Vero Bay. You know, uh, I, I work in the car industry. To tell you the truth, I probably wouldn't have guessed that high. So, yeah, it's, it's, how long is but it's, a, it's an original 428 numbers matching yeah, Mach match, 1. Yeah, that's a big deal. Wow. That's well, and Steve, car. you know, you're, a, you're kind of a car guy. You know your prices. Not quite the peak, but close, like coming down from the peak. A uh, long time ago, uh, I met a car collector, and here's the advice. He gave me two pieces of advice when buying a car. Here's what they were. One, buy the most car you can afford. He says, if you can buy something that doesn't have rusted out floorboards, hey, you don't got to go replace rusted out floorboards. So buy the most car you can afford. The next thing he said was a lot of times you might pay too much. You might buy too often, but you won't pay too much. What that means is you might 
pay the premium price, but it'll catch up with the market. So sometimes you buy too soon, but collector cards will appreciate in value. But his first piece of advice, I really liked it, you know, buy the most car you can afford. Well, I was looking for a project, but by the time I equaled everything up, you'd be into it for that much when you're done, you know. But even more. Yeah. Or even more, yeah, especially if you had a... This looks good. Uh, another one that I think looks really good is the 7172, where they start to uh, they start to flatten out a little bit. Yeah, that's the first body style 71. Yeah, trying to make it look like a 6970 Shelby with that front end, the shark sunk front end. Yeah, I think uh, for some reason it um, it has more of a uh, exotic look to it, especially when you tint the windows on them, right. keep the louvers, get the air dam on the front, like you got on here. What, want to see the engine. It, what, is the, what is the exact name for this paint color? Um, grabber Orange. Grabber Orange? In Ford. In Ford. In Mercury, it would be Competition Gold. Competition Gold. <laughs> huh. You're all done. Hey, you want to pop the engine and, or the hood and just take a look at the engine? And then we'll wrap up. We'll call it a night. Wow, look at that. So what I like about a big block is how it just completely fills out the engine compartment from fender well to fender well. This thing is stuffed. I see you got an MSD ignition on there too. So MSD, multiple spark discharge. And this, that thing just fires multiple times every time that one, one spark plug fires. So you get better combustion, you burn more fuel, and of course you get more power. Is there any other non-stock mods you have done to this? What's the carburetor under there? Is that a factory? I do have the factory at home. It came with it in the factory um, distributor. So it's got an aftermarket MSD distributor, the box, and then it's got a, a Holly, you know, aftermarket Holly on it now. Just a newer car. Yeah. yeah. But I do have it at um, the original one at home and the original um, distributor that came with it. Yeah, then it looks good. Now they call that the shaker hood scoop because you can actually see that thing oh, yeah, rocking yeah, back and forth. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Yancey, you want to try to capture any of that? <laughs> okay. So we just do a wrap up, buddy? Okay, well, hey, can I get everybody to come over here and just say hi to the online crowd? And uh, let's see if I can run through all the names. Just real quickly here. We got Jeff. What's your last name, Jeff? Valentoni. Valentoni. And you got your own detail business right here. What's the name of the business? St. Lucie Auto Spa. Okay, so this guy is a magician behind the machine. So if you need someone to work on your car in your local area, check out Jeff. We got Don Weil, the owner, came down. And Don... Uh, originally, we were going to machine polish this. After we got the car down here, we did a little testing. What we found out was, A, the paint was too soft and too thin. So we wanted to take the safe route. So we, we hand polished everything. But you're going to be back to do some machine polishing, yes. right? Okay, so Don will be back. And we got my son, Rand. Raise your hand. Rand has, has uh, been polishing paint just as long as his dad has been polishing paint. So he's kind of a veteran in all this. And he'll be back to do some machine work with us in the future. We got Dan back here at Muscle Car Express. Dan was here for one of our other uh, extreme makeovers. We had his black 67 Camaro and his gold 67 Camaro, and we put flawless show car finishes on those. Those videos are up on YouTube if you want to check that out. And for the uh, black one, we used the black fire system all by machine, and then we used the um, mother system on the gold one all by machine, and those came out really well. Then we got Rennie Cormier. Cormier here, and Rennie actually, we have a video up on autogeek.net that you can purchase that goes over how to detail your car from inside and out using the pinnacle line, and for that DVD, we actually used his Camaro. So you can see his Camaro and how beautiful it is. Then I got Lou here. Lou, what's your last name? Jones. Lou Jones. Lou is on our TV show, and sitting right outside here is a 1947 Chevy first series pickup. It's yellow with a wild blue flame job and a small block Chevy in it that's just built to the hill. And uh, we had it down here for an extreme makeover, plus being on the TV show. Then right over here, I got Steve. Steve, what's your Carlecki? Carlecki. Carlecki, yes. And Steve uh, brought his 1967 or 1969 Camaro Indy Pace car down here. And I met you at a car show. And it's one of those fun things where you walk up to somebody, you meet at the car show, and say, you know, your, your car looks really good, but I think there's a little However. room for improvement. <laughs> and uh, Steve didn't know me from Adam. He says he went up on the internet, checked out who I was, and then finally came down to 
a project night when we were working on someone else's car, figured out we actually knew what we were doing, brought his car down, and since his car's been here, he's been on the TV show and won three first place awards. Yes. And you went to the uh, Eckler's, tell us about the Eckler's uh, Super Chevy show? Uh, Eckler's uh, Winter Nationals. Winter Nationals, that's Winter what it Nationals was. up in Orlando. I took the car up there and took first in my class. And I uh, was in Super Chevy and took uh, first in my class there as well. And, and then some local stuff. And then at the Ecklers, though, you took you got 985 points out of 1,000. Yes. And that's the highest you've ever scored. Yes. And platinum that's certified. Platinum certified. And they only dinged you for like one thing, right? Uh, actually, dirty undercarriage because I drove the car 200 miles to get there. Hey, that's <laughs> nothing wrong with that. That's something to be proud of. Yes. Okay, so the 985 points out of 1,000, not bad. Anyway, that's all we have for you tonight. Uh, I think next Thursday night, we do these on Thursday nights, we're going to have a 1969, at least that's what's on the schedule, 1969 Firebird convertible. I know it's a dark metallic green, base coat, clear coat finish. The owner says he hasn't done anything to the paint in maybe 10 years. So that's on the schedule, but you never know. So just tune in next week. And goodbye from Auto Geek Show Car Garage here in sunny Stewart, Florida. And then you walk off the set. <laughs>